Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Rockefeller Center's presentation of the Portman Lecture in the Spirit of Entrepreneurship. Our speaker today is Professor Barbara Kellerman. Professor Kellerman's main appointment is as the James McGregor Burns Lecturer in Leadership at the Center for Public Leadership at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She was the Center for Public Leadership's founding executive director and has also served as its research director. This year, we at the Rockefeller Center are pleased to welcome her as a visiting professor of leadership, where she has been teaching a new course for us, Public Policy 47, Foundations of Leadership and Followership this fall. She's also teaching a mini course at the Tuck School of Business on women in leadership and has run a session in the Rockefeller Leadership Fellows Program. We like to keep our visitors very busy when they come to Hanover. This afternoon, Professor Kellerman turns her attention to leadership in the context of entrepreneurship. Just as we may think of the leader as the one who goes first, we tend to think of an entrepreneur as the one who starts the business. If the entrepreneur was merely the one who started the business, then we would regard him as a failed entrepreneur. The original meaning of the word entrepreneur is one who undertakes. A successful entrepreneur is one who not only starts the business, but undertakes the considerable challenge to grow the business into a thriving enterprise. The challenge of growing a business is the challenge of being an effective leader. There is no other magic ingredient. Leadership is the ability to mobilize people and resources toward a common goal within a shared vision. There is no successful entrepreneur without this mobilization. An image of an entrepreneur in a lonely workshop is misguided. So is an image of an entrepreneur at the top of an organizational chart. In my view, the correct image is of the entrepreneur at the center of the organization, trying to lead simultaneously in all directions at once. In that picture, the leader is surrounded by followers. What the leader can accomplish is strictly limited by what the followers will undertake. This is as critical in business as it is in any field of endeavor. Professor Kellerman is one of the foremost scholars on both the theory and the practice of leadership. Her latest book, Leadership, Essential Selections on Power, Authority, and Influence, is a wonderful introduction to leadership ideas and practices. It forms the basis of her course this term and of her presentation this afternoon. Her own writings on leadership cover some of the most critical challenges facing leaders and entrepreneurs today. To name just three of her books, consider Bad Leadership, what it is, how it happens, and why it matters. Women in leadership, state of play, and strategies for change. And what is going to become my favorite, followership, how followers are, change, are creating change and changing leaders. Professor Kellerman is a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Los Angeles Times, and the Harvard Business Review. Before proceeding with our lecture, Shooting an Elephant, or Why Be Leadership literate, literate, I'd like to take a moment to thank our partners at the Tuck School of Business for working with the Rockefeller Center to produce programs on entrepreneurship. I'd also like to acknowledge the passing earlier this year of William Portman, Dartmouth class of 1945 and Tuck School class of 1947. Mr. Portman, along with his three children, made the gift to establish the Portman Fund. He was an, exempl an exemplary entrepreneur and a leader in the civic life of his hometown of Cincinnati as well. It is through his lasting generosity that we're able to host today's lecture, as well as a number of programs on entrepreneurship throughout the year. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your kind attention. Please join me in welcoming Professor Barbara Kellerman. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you all. Are you, are you all set for this conversation? Uh, so am I too loud? I feel like I'm incredibly loud. Am I being doubly mic'd or something? Am I, are you getting deaf when I speak? You're OK? OK. Uh, so Andrew uh, gave me the perfect lead-in because I was going to say that I know the lecture is supposed to be about entrepreneurship. Uh, but to me, I do not, in my own work, make distinctions between leadership and management and entrepreneurship. And in fact, I cut out, uh, in just for this lecture, 
I cut out some characteristics of what are said to be entrepreneurial characteristics, personal initiative, ability to consolidate resources, opportunistic behaviors, so forth and so on. And guess what? They are, as far as I'm concerned, leadership characteristics. So um, from here on in, I'm going to use the word leadership, but I'm happy to substitute entrepreneurship. So let me begin. Uh, those of you, and there are some of you in this room that I recognize, uh, those of you who know me a little tend, that I, tend, uh, tend to know about me that I'm quite dark. I'm a pessimist about a lot of leadership stuff. I look at the underbelly of leadership. Uh, so I thought maybe I would start with a typically dark commentary on leadership. Uh, and read to you simply directly uh, from, from a, um, uh, I was asked to uh, make a, a brief blog or comment on Leadership 2011. Uh, and I thought I would read that to you because it kind of sets the stage for the rest of my talk, which is about changing the way we educate our leaders. As you all know, leadership is big business these days. And part of what I'm feeling and experiencing, having been in the business for a long time, is the need to change the way we train leaders, educate leaders, and for that matter, followers as well. So let me set the stage for this rather, uh, this particular bleak commentary, and then some statistics to follow by saying this is my view, not just of leadership 2011, but of leadership and followership and the world as it is changing, as we sit here, stand here, in the uh, beginning in the late 20th century and certainly into the 21st. By every available indicator, leadership 2011 will be more of the same. That is, Life will be increasingly hard for leaders of every stripe, boxed in on the one side by problems of unprecedented complexity, and on the other by followers who refuse, well, to follow. This trend is not new. Aggravated by changes in our collective cultures, by globalization, and more recently by seismic shifts in technologies, what's been evident for years is that leaders' capacity to control the context has been weakened sometimes to the point of finding it difficult, if not impossible, to get much of anything accomplished. Moreover, the historical arc, the decrease, decrease in power, authority, and influence of leaders and the increase in the power and influence of followers supports the current condition. For at least since the Enlightenment, there has been a democratization, a leveling, if you will, of the playing field on which those who are weaker are more willing than before to take on those who are stronger. At the most obvious level, this dynamic is evident in the public sector. Even the most visible and apparently the most powerful public leaders are newly vulnerable. Barack, <coughs> excuse me, Barack Obama, only recently a hero leader, is now merely another elected official, one tarred by the media's brush, dragged down by constituents as disenchanted as they are deeply disappointed, and held regularly and relentlessly accountable for whatever it is that ails us. So it is with other political leaders in the Western world as well, whether Chancellor Angela Merkel, whose approval ratings have plummeted in spite of Germany's relatively stellar economic uh, performance, or Nicolas Sarkozy, the French president, whose fellow French citizens took to the streets in huge numbers only recently, sometimes violently, to protest the government's ostensibly outrageous proposal to increase the retirement age from all of 60 to all of 62. Nor is Asia exempt from the syndrome to which I refer. For decades, Japan has had what can only be described as a merry-go-round of prime ministers, while China's political elite has been obliged to respond, to adjust, to increasingly emboldened constituents 
who employ everything from traditional street protests to the newest internet technologies to register and disseminate their complaints loud and clear. Even Myanmar, for, one, for years one of the few places on the planet to have remained entirely isolated and insular, authoritarian to the point of being totalitarian, has had, of all things, recently an election which, however flawed, opened the door, perhaps at least a crack. Let me hasten to add that the weakened leader is by no means confined to the political realm. Business leaders, even those apparently at the pinnacle of professional success, are anything other than exempt from the humbling to which I refer. Lloyd Blankfein, CEO, of course, of Goldman Sachs, was humiliated in the press and is now at least a little bit of a public pariah. Mark Hurd, though he landed on his feet at Oracle, was not spared the public spectacle of being fired by the board of Hewlett-Packard. Uh, even the iconic Steve Jobs, who when the iPhone 4 proved slightly flawed, felt obliged to mount a public defense. These are only three of similar stories that can readily be culled, not only from the United States, but from elsewhere in the world as well. Stories in which uh, business corporate leaders were obliged publicly to eat crow. Put another way, a decade into the 21st century, business leaders, especially those astride the biggest companies, have become public figures no longer able so easily to hide their deficits, literal or figurative, no longer able so easily to resist our scrutiny, no longer able so easily to avoid being grist for our collective mill. The bottom line is this. To lead, never easy, is more difficult than ever before. Moreover, the benefits, while in most cases still somewhat great, are now commingled with costs that historically are unprecedented. Leadership 2011, a hard row to hoe. What then is to be done? For the purposes of this particular discussion, let me discuss first and foremost what business schools, because of the emphasis on entrepreneurship, that claim first and foremost to train, educate, and graduate leaders, managers, and social entrepreneurs, how do they do so in a way that makes these people successful, but also socially responsible? So that's my somewhat dark, overarching comment, which I will buttress with similarly dark statistics. I do not want you to leave here in a good mood. You're to be depressed as you go to, to dinner or drinking, whatever you're going to do after this. Okay, uh, this, is, um, this is actually, um, as uh, Andrew Samwick mentioned, I'm at the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard's Kennedy School. We have for several years at the center done a study of confidence in America's political leaders. And uh, again, the results are rather grim. The decline in confidence reached a nadir in 2008, when only 26% of Americans, in other words, about a quarter of Americans, said our leaders were effective and doing a good job. This year, for the third year in a row, overall confidence in leaders remains significantly below average. Only 38% believe our leaders are doing a good job. And I wish I could show you this a little more colorfully. I don't have it on PowerPoint. This is a breakdown by sector. Suffice it to say, at the very bottom of the list of confidence in our leaders, guess, OK, you can guess. Who do we trust? Which leaders do we trust at the bottom, least of all? Uh, nope. We love our politicians compared with these people. Wall Street. Hello. Very bottom of the list. I mean, we basically don't trust Wall Street at all or not at all, but Andrew is right. Right after that, at the very bottom, members of Congress, the media comes next. Put another way, the only leaders we trust somewhat, think are somewhat effect, are military leaders, medical leaders, nonprofit and charity leaders, and guess what, the Supreme Court. 
and that's probably likely to go down the tube soon too. So uh, in other words, the picture is not so wonderful. Now that's on the one side, okay? On the other side, we have what I call, uh, I, I'm actually very fond of this phrase, my students have heard me say it many times, this term, what I call the leadership industry. So what is the leadership industry? Without uh, making it sound uh, too ugly, it is a product of capitalism, it's an American product, and it's about 30 or so years old, and it thrives on the proposition that you can teach leadership, you can teach everybody how to be a leader, you don't need a special kind of set or skills or talents. You run a course with the word leadership in it, anybody can register for the course. And on top of that, you can teach these people how to be leaders fast. So we can do it, everybody, you can do it, it it's completely democratic, you can do it very fast. And in the mission statements of schools and universities, including, I might add, Dartmouth, which is about responsible leaders, growing responsible leaders, is the word leadership. Similarly, in the corporate sector, you have countless executive programs, schools, coaches, whatever, who charge a lot of money to train people how to be leaders. So it strikes me, uh, and I, you know, in the Q&A you can say, silly Barbara Kellerman, what's the matter with you? I see some of my students are already going, yeah, she's silly, Barbara Kellerman. What's the matter with you for raising this question? For 30 or so years, we have had, an, as I said, a veritable industry devoted to educating and training leaders, which is what many schools do, many coaches and so forth and so on do. And on the other hand, there is this feeling that leadership is harder than it ever was before, that we don't trust leaders, that we can't, we can't either in the public sector or in the private sector seem to get a handle on how to train and educate good leaders. So the rest of my presentation uh, in the next uh, 40 or so mis uh, minutes is going to be about my idea which I might add was shared by a few little people like maybe Plato, for example, Aristotle, for example, about how you might train leaders in the 21st century. Uh, it is a new and different approach to the training of leaders, but it's not so much about the training of leaders as it is about growing people who, to be as wise and as smart about the human condition. It's not about leadership training or development, leadership development as those terms are conventionally used. It is in effect, and that's what this book is, it is in effect a liberal arts approach to leadership education, but in the broad sense of that word, in the very broadest sense of that word. And that's really the case that I'm going to make to you in the next few uh, minutes. So um, as you'll see from some of these comments, I am not the only one to raise questions. Again, I'm focusing this particularly on business schools, but we could as well talk about colleges and other kinds of professional schools and corporations, to raise the question of how you train a leader. Uh, you can see the comment by Benes and O'Toole. You can see the comment by Kurana, uh, which uh, Kurana's book, I don't know if any of you know that book, it's about uh, what's happened to business schools over the last uh, several decades. And he raises some very, very serious questions about whether business schools are accomplishing the mission that they uh, set out for themselves. Here's another one, this is from the New York Times earlier this year. Uh, the dean of the Rotman School of Management is trying in effect to change the curriculum, this is at the University of Toronto, uh, to make it something of what he calls a liberal arts MBA. Uh, and that leads me to ask the question of what would a liberal arts MBA look like? For sure, it would be a departure of what business schools are doing now. 
What business schools are doing now is essentially a three-step process, which you see above you. Approach number one, transmission of knowledge. Number two, development of interpersonal skills. Number three, and I cannot tell you the degree to which this is done uh, all over the United States and many other countries in the world. By the way, this is not an, it started in the United States, how-to culture, we can do anything, including learning how to be a leader. Uh, but it's now a global phenomenon, an association that I co-founded years ago, maybe 12 years ago, called the International Leadership Association, which met a week or two ago in Boston, now has, just for your information, some 2,000 members worldwide with members in 40 countries. So this has stopped being an American phenomenon. Anyway, this is the approaches that B schools use, business schools use now. So that brings me to my own uh, point of view, which is what would an MBA that is with a true liberal arts orientation, what would it look like? So first of all, it would have a historical perspective. My own view that teaching leadership, <laughs> my own view is that teaching leadership in a purely contemporaneous context is simply misguided. I mean, how do you understand leadership in 2010, depending on where it is, without having some sense of the history that preceded it? So I would abolish the extreme focus on what is now in favor of adding to it. I w of course, I wouldn't abolish the what is now focus, but I would add to it the focus on what was before, how does what is now grow out of and relate to what was before. I would have a multidisciplinary approach. I would bring in virtually every one of the social sciences. I would bring in some of the hard sciences, which are starting to tell us a lot about how the brain in particular works. I would bring in the arts. I don't know how you do leadership without bringing in the arts. I love the arts. I'm going to talk a little bit later about Shakespeare. Let me tell you, if you want to know about leadership, you want to know about power, you want to know about authority, you want to know about influence, read Shakespeare. A master, an absolute master. Cultures and context, you, br you must um, put leadership and followership, and some of you may know that I almost never, whenever I use the word leadership, I'm talking about leadership and followership together. Uh, so you must insert that in the culture, in the context. What, you know, it makes a difference that we're sitting here at Dartmouth, that we're sitting here in Hanover, that we're sitting in New Hampshire as opposed to another state, that we're in the United States as opposed to being in Brazil. Those things matter. The complexities of what's happening around the world. I happen to see, anybody see Charlie Rose last night? Am I the only one who watches? You know who Charlie Rose is, right? <laughs> Hello, Tell, do you know what television is? I like television. I, I, I like Charlie Rose. I like Dancing with the Stars. Anybody want to watch that? I do. I like television. So Charlie Rose had Tom Friedman on last night. Tom Friedman, as you know, wrote a book about the flattened, you know, flat earth. And, he, you know, when you listen to a guy like that, how you can talk about leadership in the United States without taking account of what's going on to use the most obvious and extreme examples, Brazil, China, India, forget it. It's just the, the old boundaries are dropping, and it just doesn't make any sense anymore to talk about leadership separate from the larger global context in which it's embedded. And finally, critical thinking. Uh, I try to do that in my classes. I try to do that with my students, get them to think about the hardest questions pertaining to the human condition because leadership is, you know, um, it's not about turning out nice little undergraduates and nice little corporate executives. It's about some of the largest issues about who controls whom and how. And I try to get students to think about the big questions, so critical thinking, and to ask the big questions. So leadership learning, to me, is a process that takes time. If I were to develop a leadership curriculum, I can promise you. You know, do you, how many of you have ever been to an executive program in leadership education? Any of you ever extended? 
Well, they're typically, as you may know, they're typically really short, like a weekend, maybe a week, maybe a couple of weeks. Learn how to be a leader in a couple of weeks. At the undergraduate and graduate levels at the Kennedy School, it's not very different from here. Take a course and you'll learn how to be a leader. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. A leadership learning process takes time. The great leadership theorists all understood that. This is not something you can do quickly. It is not something you can do easily. It's a complicated process, a multivarious process. If I were doing leadership at Dartmouth, I would probably have it throughout the entire four-year curriculum in different guises and in different ways. It wouldn't be a course here and there. It would be a curriculum that runs through all four years in various ways. OK, I think you get the point here. Um, I guess I would, let me say, I would want to say a word about the last bullet point on here. In the wake of Enron, 2001, you all know when I say Enron? OK. In the wake of Enron, guess what business schools did? You're a clever group. Guess what business schools did in the wake of Enron? Yes, I know you. Wait one second, sorry. Ethics courses. What were you going to say? Shredding courses. Shredding? <laughs> Both. That and that. Uh, ethics courses. In the main, their response to this was ethics courses, which are now, by the way, the Kennedy School has them. It's no longer just business courses. They're kind of all over the place. What's the problem? You're not dumb, again. What's the problem with an ethics course? Anybody? You can't teach it. OK, somebody said can't teach it. Can we teach ethics? The final exam comes 30 years later. <laughs> That's a good answer. Well, let me just stay with it. Can, can we teach ethics? Yes. Are you ethical? Did you learn it? I try to be ethical, and I did learn it, but it took about 30 years. Ah, oh, well, then I can only say thank you. You're making my case. Look. If we could teach, if we knew how to teach ethics, if we really knew how to teach ethics, what would we do? Teach it. We would teach it. Do we learn ethics as five-year-olds? Do we learn it as 15-year-olds? Do we learn it as 25 or 35-year-olds? We don't really have much of an idea of how to teach ethics. If we did, we would have done it. We would, everybody would be ethical. It would be a perfect world. I'm not saying we shouldn't have ethics courses. What I'm railing against is not the ethics course, it's the illusion that if you take an ethics course, you're going to be an ethical person. And apropos your point about 30 years later, that you're going to be an ethical person. You're taking it when you're, let's say, 27 years old. And that ethics course is going to make you be ethical when you're 47 and 57 year old. So it's the simplistic approach to all of this that I'm not so happy about. But I'm a contrarian, as you, as you, I think, begin to understand. So here's what I would do if I were queen of the leadership world, which I decidedly am not. I would teach leadership as a holistic whole. I would never, ever, ever, ever have a leadership course that focused on leaders to the exclusion of followers, ever. Some of you know, to me, followers, as I said earlier, and I will say it probably at least one more time before we disband, Followers are every bit as important as leaders, arguably in many cases more important. By the way, I'll give you an example just a few days ago. Well, you don't watch TV, so does anybody watch TV? Yay, I got a few TV. Anybody heard of a guy named Keith Olbermann? OK, so who knows what happened to Keith Olbermann a couple of days ago? You're on. You want to say? They found out that he donated to three political candidates. The har who would have guessed that on MSNBC, one of those guys would have donated to Democratic candidates? Small sums, by the way. So what happened to him? He was suspended. He was suspended. Then what happened? He was brought back, correct. Why was he brought back? Why was Keith Oberman brought back? A guy named Phil Griffin suspended him, the guy, had, guy who heads MSNBC News. Why was Phil, uh, Keith Oberman brought back within a couple of days? Uh, 
<laughs> so he wouldn't be, I, I like the answer, but no, not exactly. Does anybody know why he came back so quickly? An online campaign in no time flat, and that's the way technology works, one of the many things that undercuts leaders. Online campaign, three, 400,000 signatures in no time flat, and they felt obliged to bring him back but, and bring him back immediately. In other words, MSNBC had lost control. The executives at MSC had lost control. Oberman's thrilled to pieces. I don't know if you saw him the other night. He can't believe it, and he's thanking his audience and thanking his supporters. The followers said to MSNBC, bring this guy back, and they did. So that's what I mean. In this day and age, the culture has changed. The technology has changed in ways that leaders simply can't control things that easily anymore. I don't mean they never, I don't want to be quoted. Is there a student newspaper guy here? Do not quote me and say leaders are irrelevant, unimportant, they can't control anything ever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's much harder than it was for various reasons, perhaps above all changes in culture and technology. Uh, the context, again, I don't know how you do leaders and followers unless you have a sense of the context in which they're embedded. Triad number two, power, authority, and influence. My students are sick of hearing me make these distinctions, but they all matter. They are very different one from another, and we conflate them all the time. Big mistake. And finally, and obviously to me, but not so obvious to most of my colleagues, the past matters, the present of course matters, and so does the future. Going back to the three things that I said business schools do, that is they transmit knowledge. So I would raise the question, what knowledge exactly should we be transmitting? Does anybody have a handle on what knowledge matters most? Which skills matter most, in, especially in a wired world? Historically, in the last several years, you know the phrase emotional intelligence? Daniel Goleman's well-known phrase, what he means is the capacity to connect interpersonally. And it's really, really important. How many of you know when Obama, the guy that's our president, first met Mitch McConnell, who happens to be the leader of this, the Republican leader of the uh, uh, Senate leader, in other words, leader of the opposition? Anybody read this front page article in the New York Times maybe a month ago? It took Obama 18 months to invite him to the White House? This is not good. This is not something you he would not have learned that in leadership school. But one of the things that I'm saying is that in a wired world, I think face-to-face -face and emotional intelligence matters a lot. But in a wired world, it's not the only thing that matters. There are other kinds of skills that matter in a wired world. And finally, I take issue with, uh, you've all heard, most of you, the term 360-degree feedback, Myers-Briggs. Huge emphasis, huge in leadership training on self-analysis. How do other people see me? What's that joke about, uh, let's talk about you for a change. What do you think of me? That's a little bit what leadership education is like. Incredible focus on self-development. But as I put it here, why look in when looking out in the 21st century may matter more? Okay, some other kinds of questions. What about the followers? You won't be surprised to hear me say that. In the next, anything to be learned from bad leadership? Sad to say uh, there's almost nothing out there. There's a little something on bad leadership, but almost nothing. Most of the literature is how to be a good leader, how to have a vision, how to communicate, how to be a wonderful person. And as I sometimes say, how can you deal with pathology if all you're doing is looking at health? How can you deal with leadership if you're not taking on one of the most interesting leadership questions of all, which is how to stop bad leadership? It's not only about how to be a good leader, it's how to stop or at least slow be bad leaders. It's not something we teach, not something we look at. How and when do we teach right from wrong, so forth and so on. Um, so, as you know by now about me, uh, I've spent most of my professional life in leadership. And I decided a few years ago at the Kennedy School, it dawned on me, it dawned on me, you know, one of the, you know, leadership is a kind of a stepchild in the academy. 
Uh, there's no leadership department, uh, a lot of more rigorous social scientists go, it's not really very serious, it's a little loosey-goosey, I don't know. Uh, so it's always a little bit at the margins of the academy, and one of the charges against it is there's no core curriculum. Leadership does not have a body of knowledge which every leader should learn. And I've thought about that for a long time, and I finally realized that there was no great books course on leadership. You know what, remember the great books of St. John's and the Chicago School and so forth and so on. So there is a tradition in the United States and elsewhere in the world of great books courses. You learn about the human condition. By, by the way, uh, if, you're, were, if you were undergraduates at Columbia instead of Dartmouth, you would be having a course in Western civilization a required course at Columbia, which is in effect a great books course, where they read, the undergraduates read, these core great writers. So I decided to look and see, you know, is there such, could there be such a thing as a great books course on leadership? And lo and behold, there's a lot of great literature. I mean really great. I am setting the bar when I talk about great, yay high. Okay, I don't mean kind of a little bit great. I mean really great as in seminal, timeless, and universal. Like Machiavelli, great. Great, great. High bar. Okay, so you can read these things yourself. You don't need to, me to go through them. The last one I'll say, what, I'm asserting, what I am asserting, by the way, is that there is uh, this, what I call now the leadership canon, the, a body of great leadership literature, again, which if I were queen of the leadership world, I'm not, by the way, I don't mean to sound as if I'm praising myself. When I teach this course, which I do now, and when I write this book, the book is full of my commentary, but it's not my words. These are the great works of the leadership literature, the by people who have thought about these issues <coughs> from time immemorial. Okay, are you all okay? Are you live? You're there. Do you want to? You want me to take? Want to go out for a sandwich or something? <laughs> Should I continue? Okay. So here are my ten tenets. I, I like everything in tens. It's kind of cute. Ten tenets, ten <coughs> themes. First, there is a leadership canon, though not one conventionally claimed. This canon is not inscribed in stone. In other words, the book that's out there, the book that I've put together as a result of this Kennedy School teaching experience, is not meant to be the Bible. You can dump some of it. You can put something else in that's important. I often, at the Kennedy School, I often have students from uh, other countries who go, oh my god, you don't have our Argentinian great poet, whatever, whatever, and I go, fine. You do a paper on whoever. So it's not meant to be inscribed in stone. The canon is and must be multidisciplinary and multicultural. I break the canon up into three parts. It is literature about leadership. It is literature as leadership. My students who are sitting here are not allowed to answer this question. What do I mean by literature as leadership? Somebody who is not in my class, somebody who's in this room, what do I mean when I say literature as leadership? Where the, the writing of something is in and of itself an act of leadership. Anybody want to give me an example? Yes? But animal vegetable miracle is an act of leadership in terms of teaching people how to imagine a new order for... Yeah, but I'm thinking of a text. I'm thinking of a great text, a great timeless text that changed the way people that was in itself an act of leadership. Yeah. The Bible. The Bible, the, which by the way, I have stayed away. I think that's a good example. Changes the way it is in, of itself an act of leadership, changed the way people thought. As a PS to that, I stay away from religion. Uh, but I think it's a good example. But I'll give you some other examples later on. I'll give, uh, let me throw out one example now, which I'll get turned to again in a moment. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. An example of a book that changed the way, oh my God. The environment, it matters. The book was itself an act of leadership. It is a great piece of leadership literature. And the final category of this literature is literature by leaders. And needless to say, the great literature on leadership is simultaneously 
a great literature on followership. It is separately about power, authority, and influence. One of the things I love to teach, and if I had time, which I don't, I would have a little bit of a history lesson right in here. As you heard me say earlier, there is an arc of human history that matters here. To, sh to abbreviate it, it's from leaders, from people up there, kings and queens who used to rule the world all the time, to people down here, to people who are now emailing MSNBC and saying, if you don't put Keith Olbermann back, back on the air in 24 hours, I'm not, never going to watch MSNBC again as long as I live. That's a, that is, didn't happen overnight. That is an arc of human history that began in spades during the Enlightenment. John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, key figures in the evolution of power, authority, and influence. Uh, leadership literature is sometimes just great literature. I think of this as an English course. I love some of it. It's not all great literature, but there's some great stuff in there, such exciting stuff. The pen is sometimes mightier than the sword. I don't know, the Communist Manifesto. It changed the world. It changed the world. How can you understand leadership if you don't understand the impact a document such as the Communist Manifesto has? It's a big deal, a document like that. Not a little thing. Uh, OK, 10 themes. These themes keep recurring in the great leadership literature. Confucius was teaching leaders. Du Bois was teaching leaders. All the leadership literature now is about teaching leaders. There has been a presumption that you can teach leadership, although the presumption the nature of that presumption, the way you teach leadership, has changed over time. The importance of the view of human nature. The leadership literature depends on how you see humankind. If you think people are fundamentally good, that's going to lead you to a set of conclusions about leadership. But if you think they're fundamentally bad or unreliable or somewhere in between, that's going to lead you to another set of conclusions. Let me ask you about a phrase that everybody in this room is incredibly familiar with, checks and balances. What is the view of human nature that underlies the phrase checks and balances? What underlies that phrase? What do you think about the human condition? Yeah. It's cynical, kind of. It is cynical, kind of, because? Um, if you have, you, if you, you, the only reason to check someone is if you don't believe that they're. Exactly. You can't trust them. We better have a system of checks and balances, because if we don't have a system of checks and balances, things could go awry. That's exactly right. The role of rage and outrage. Some of the greatest leadership literature uh, is, grows out of, to use uh, Hunter Thompson's words, fear and loathing. Uh, people in jail, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, Nelson Mandela's great, great speech, not the ones that he delivered when he got out of jail, but the one he delivered in 1974 at the dock of the Rivonia trial where he said, I am prepared to die. Great, great documents. Mandela explaining why he began as an apostle of Gandhi and then decided violence was necessary. That's, that's anger. The attraction of the great man, we always fall in love with the great man. Unfortunately, we rarely fall in love with the great woman, but that's another conversation. The rise of the follower, the growing inclusiveness, the power of the pen, you get the other points. I want to keep on going. So if you're going to give me a few more minutes, which I think you have to, because I've been asked to go on, unless you're really rude, I, I get until about 5.30. I want to give you some examples of how much greater the leadership literature is than anything that is, um, that is kind of its vague copy or, or sad emanation. So let me go to the importance of instruction. So I uh, just pulled a few things, and here is one about, from Bloomberg Business Week. Remember, I'm kind of constructing this talk around business schools and the corporate sector, entrepreneurial leadership and all that. So in Bloomberg Business Week a couple of months ago, there's an article about how there's no one best way to grow leaders, 
The companies, though, that do it best share certain characteristics. And then they talk about the top 20 companies focus on multiple fronts, articulating how leadership behavior needs to change to meet the challenges of the future. The best companies for developing leaders recognize the value of strong leadership in both good times and bad. So that's Bloomberg Business Week on the importance of instruction, how the best companies uh, who teach leadership uh, do certain things and have certain consistencies. But let me read to you, instead of Bloomberg Business Week, let me read to you just one of the chapters. These are little tiny segments from the great, approximately 5th or 6th century BC, from the great Lao Tzu, who talked about leadership. He talked about the leader as a sage. And I will read you just a very short one. Number 9, chapter 9. Better stop short than fill it to the brim. Over sharpen the blade and the edge will soon blunt. Amass a store of gold and jade and no one can protect it. Claim wealth and titles and disaster will follow. Retire when the work is done. That is the way of heaven. View of human nature. Now I'm going to read you a paraphrase of Machiavelli, and then I'm going to read you Machiavelli. And you can tell me what you'd rather study and learn. So this is from an article titled, What Can Machiavelli Teach You About Business? And he comes up. This is a guy named Roberto Rocha, if anybody wants to Google it. Uh, he comes up with eight points. And I don't mean to dismiss them or diminish them, but I just want to give you a choice between his eight points about, that you can learn from Machiavelli or the real thing. Number one, pay attention to employees. Number two, maintain an air of power. Number three, don't let others know what you're thinking. Number four, appeal to people's passions. Number five, assume your competition wants to take your place. Six, associate yourself with smart people. Seven, don't isolate yourself. And eight, create your own legacy. Now let me read to you just a little bit from The Prince. From this a dispute arises whether it is better to be loved than feared, or the reverse. The response is that one would want to be both the one and the other, but because it is difficult to put them together, it is much safer to be feared than loved, if one has to lack one of the two. For one can say this generally of men, that they are, apropos view of human nature, this is Machiavelli's view of human nature, that they are ungrateful, fickle, pretenders, dissemblers, evaders of danger, eager for gain. When you do them good, they're yours, offering you their blood, property, lives, and children. As I say, they are yours. But when it is close to you, when they come too close and they are not satisfied, they revolt. And that prince who has founded himself entirely on their words, stripped of other preparation, is ruined. For friendships that are acquired at a price and not with greatness and nobility of spirit are bought, but they are not owned. And when the time comes, they cannot be spent. And men have less hesitation to offend one who makes himself loved than one who makes himself feared. For love is held by a chain of obligation which, because men are wicked, is broken at every opportunity for their own utility. But fear is held by a dread of punishment that never forsakes you. the role of rage and outrage. <coughs> As I said, impossible to uh, overestimate this in the great leadership literature. I could read you some of the uh, stuff about 
violence in the streets, et cetera, et cetera. But instead, I'm going to read you from Franz Fanon, whose book, The Wretched of the Earth, I hope some of you have heard of it, talks about the fury of the colonized against the colonizers and how the only solution to that is violence. By the way, it is a not uncommon theme. The powerless thinking to themselves, what can we do to take power and coming up only with the solution of violence. Decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is clearly an agenda for total disorder. It is an encounter between two congenitally antagonistic forces that owe their singularity to the kind of reification secreted and nurtured by their colonial situation. Colonialization reeks of red-hot cannonballs and bloody knives. For the last can be first only after a murderous and decisive confrontation between the two protagonists. This determination to have the last move up to the front, to have them clamber up the famous echelons of an organized society can only be achieved by resorting to every means, including, of course, violence. The attraction of the great man, the tireless attraction we have for the great man, our worshiping of leaders, which we, I fear, are hardwired to do. A little section on Steve Jobs just a few weeks ago. Steve Jobs' passionate perfectionism, a contradictory blend of a hot temper and cool temperament, is embedded in the soul of many new machines. He has an aura. The 50-year-old Jobs, usually clad in jeans and a black turtleneck, has established an aura around his, quote, insanely great products, which are beautiful and brash, fabulous and functional. Have you ever run your thumb around the iPod's sleek, smooth click wheel? Jobs himself has been labeled a saint and a sinner and now a saint again. Last year, Jobs cheated death, escaped a cancer scare. This year, Apple will generate robust revenues and its stock is bristling with good health. Jobs was lucky. We are too because our lives are different and much more interesting with this man leading us into the future. And then there's Thomas Carlyle, the great 19th century theorist who, wrote, who is the epitome of the believer in the great man, and I will read just a sentence from him. We have undertaken to discourse here on the great man, their manner of appearance in our world's business, how they have shaped themselves in the world's history, what ideas men have formed of them, what work they did. On heroes, namely, on their reception and performance, what I call hero worship and the heroic in human affairs. History, all of history, is the history of these. Mary Parker Follett on the rise of the follower, and I will not take you through that one because I want to be able to cover some of the others. Suffice it to say, she is a pioneer in modern leadership and management and pays attention to the follower in a new and wonderful way. Mary Wollstonecraft, one of the original of the Western feminists from the 18th century. If you want to read how women in the 18th century, by the way, she's the grandmother. Any of you know, some of you know? Yes. Yes, she's Mary Shelley's mother, so I call her Frankenstein's grandmother. <laughs> she's the grandmother of Frankenstein, but a fabulous feminist. How, do you, how are you a feminist when nobody was a feminist? and her beautiful language warning women that if they <coughs> waited until men adored them only, they would be waiting forever because they were like a flower on the stalk who would soon fade and have no man at all to take care of them. Thomas Paine, the great common sense, 
a book that, to use Jefferson's words, lit the fire that lit the revolution. Literature about leadership. Uh, I, God, there's so much on the charismatic leader, but let me read to you from Max Weber, who originally coined the phrase charismatic leadership. The term charisma will be applied to a certain quality of an individual by virtue of which he is set apart from ordinary men and treated as endowed with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. We debase the word charisma now. We use it loosely. We apply it to celebrities. We throw it around, but if you go back to the man that 20, the early 20th century sociologist Max Weber, who coined the term charismatic leadership, you will see the beautiful power the charismatic leadership leader holds, keeping his, generally again, his followers in thrall. Shakespeare, again, Shakespeare is taught all the time in leadership courses. My own preference would be if you want to teach Shakespeare and you want to know about power and authority, you go back to the bard himself. Henry V, full of lessons about leadership. Julius Caesar, full of lessons about leadership. Rachel Carson, and then I will tell you why I have titled this lecture Shooting the Elephant or Shooting an Elephant. Rachel Carson, as I said, Silent Spring, an example of liter uh, literature as leadership. But I have it here under this particular title because of the beauty of the prose. I don't know how many years ago you've read Silent Spring, but let me read to you just one paragraph and you will have a sense of how some of the leadership literature is also great literature very beginning of her book, A Fable for Tomorrow. There once was a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. The town lay in the midst of a checkerboard of prosperous farms with fields of grain and hillsides of orchards where in spring white clouds of bloom drifted above the green fields. In autumn, oak and maple and birch set up a blaze of color that flamed and flickered across a backdrop of pines. Then foxes barked in the hills and deer silently crossed the fields, half hidden in the midst of the fall mornings. And then skipping down a paragraph, then a strange blight crept over the area and everything began to change. Some evil spell settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens. The cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was a shadow of death. And now my last piece of leadership literature, which is in fact not in the book and not in the course, but it is the greatest single exemplar of why I think the liberal arts approach to learning leadership, learning entrepreneurship, learning management, you can substitute any word you like, is so important. There is a short story by a man named George Orwell. The short story is titled, Shooting an Elephant. It is never, ever included in the leadership literature but it is the best single example that I know of where in just a few economical words, you get three things. You get the leader, you get the followers, you get the context, and you get the complexity of the <coughs> dynamic among the three. It is a short story that talks about leadership whole, not in parts, but as a complicated whole explaining why it is of enduring interest to those of us who have begun to study it years ago and who never tire of it to this day. I'm going to read you a few sections where you get the idea. Again, Shooting an Elephant, George Orwell. This is, by the way, an autobiographical story. Everybody agrees this is Orwell talking. He himself had been stationed in Burma. It takes place in Burma. It's a reflection on the colonial condition and on 
power and powerlessness and how fungible they are. I had halted on the road. He had been asked to come to, he was a policeman, and he was asked to come to a raging elephant. As soon as I saw the elephant, which by then had calmed down, I knew with perfect certainty that I ought not to shoot him. It is a serious matter to shoot a working elephant, and one obviously not, one ought obviously not do it if it can possibly be avoided. And at that distance, peaceably eating, the elephant looked no more dangerous than a cow. I thought then, and I think now, that his attack was already passing, in which case he would merely wander harmlessly about until people came back and finally caught him and brought him back to where he belonged. I did not in the least want to shoot him. I decided that I would watch for a little while longer to make sure he did not turn savage again and then go home. But at that moment, I glanced round at the crowd that had followed me. It was an immense crowd, 2,000 at the least and growing every minute. It blocked the road for a long distance on either side. I looked at the sea, and you'll have to pardon the political incorrectness of this, but I'm reading Orwell. I looked at the sea of yellow faces above the garish clothes faces all happy and excited over this bit of fun, all, <coughs> all certain that the elephant was going to be shot. They were watching me as they would a conjurer about to perform a magic trick. They did not like me, but with the magic rifle in my hands, I was momentarily worth watching. And suddenly I realized I would have to shoot the elephant after all. The people expected me to do it, and I had to do it. I could feel their 2,000 wills pressing me forward irresistibly. And then somewhat later. When I pulled the trigger, I did not hear the bang or feel the kick. The elephant in that instant, in too short a time, one would have thought even for the bullet to get there, a mysterious change had come over him, a terrible one. He neither stirred nor fell, but every line of his body had altered. He looked suddenly stricken, shrunken, immensely old, as though the frightful impact of the bullet had paralyzed him without knocking him down. At last, after what seemed like a long time, he sagged flabbily to his knees. His mouth slobbered, an enormous senility seemed to have fallen upon him. One could have imagined him thousands of years old. I fired again in the same spot. At the second shot, he did not collapse, but climbed with desperate slowness to his feet and stood weakly upright with legs sagging and head drooping. I fired a third time. That was the shot that did it for him. You could see the agony of it jolt his whole body and knock the last remnant of strength from his legs. But in falling, he seemed for a moment to rise, for as his hind legs collapsed again beneath him, he seemed to tower upward like a huge rock toppling, his trunk reaching skyward like a tree. He trumpeted for the first and only time, and then down he came, his belly toward me, with a crash that seemed to shake the ground even where I lay. I'm done. <laughs> I will take questions if you have any or comments. Uh, I think there are some mics. Um, and I guess you're supposed to speak into the mics uh, with anything you'd like to say. We can have a memorial to the elephant if you would <laughs> prefer. Yes. Hi, I'm Hi. <coughs> I'm Sydney Freeberg. I'm actually tomorrow's speaker. And That's great. Y Hi. <laughs> uh, I cover the Defense Department, so there's a lot of talk about leadership. And I'm one of the people who's terribly skeptical 
about the leadership industry as I think you are. I'm very pleased to see you actually advocate reading real books as opposed to business bestsellers. And it seems that a lot of times leadership is either this inevitable personal quality of character or alternatively, it basically is shorthand, especially in the Anglo-American sort of gentleman officer, gentleman manager tradition, for I don't actually you know how to do... You want to say gentle? I mean, I'm a woman, so you might want to throw in gentle woman. Well, but it's, it's a tradition of being idiotic, so you want to be uh, excluded. Oh, uh, okay, okay. If it's that tradition, that's fine. But basically, amounts to I don't actually know anything myself, and I can't do anything myself. But I come from a good family, and I went to a good school, and I control resources to make other people who actually know their ass from their elbow hopefully do something effective. And I'm hoping there's some useful middle ground of I mean, what actually is leadership? What actually does it mean in between the basically applied bullshitting on the one hand and the well, it's something Good you're title born for with. A course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't taken your course, so give it to me in five minutes. No, I'm going to call the. I'm going to switch the title of the course to "Applied Bullshit." <laughs> um, uh, you know what is leadership? Uh, first of all, uh, I'm sorry. Your first name was S Sydney. Sydney. That's what I thought. A wonderfully old-fashioned, wonderful name, Sydney. Um, uh, first of all, if you went to the texts, you would get, what, a hundred definitions, a thousand definitions. If you asked this room, everybody would come up with their, their own definition. My answer to your question is it depends. Uh, this is a wildly infuriating answer to people because I often say it depends when they ask me that question. Uh, you know, uh, let me give you my, a few parameters for me. Uh, first of all, 99.9% .9 of the leadership literature in the modern leadership industry has the word good before leadership. So the assumption is, well, we're talking about good leadership. So when you say to me, oh, it's in the workplace and so forth, what is leadership? And it's almost always assumed to be something good and something noble. When I use the word, I use it, as you can tell, since you've heard a book I wrote was called Bad Leadership. Uh, I, to me, the word is value-free. And it also admits, as you've heard me say, to power, authority, and influence. So what is power? Now, most people, again, I am such a deviant. I'm such an abnormal person in the leadership industry. I admit that I think power belongs in the leadership lexicon. To take the extreme example, my students have heard me say this, I'll take Hitler. My field leadership studies, or whatever you want to call it, does not talk about Hitler as a leader. He doesn't enter the lexicon as a leader. In fact, in an iconic book titled Leadership by a guy named James McGregor Burns, to whom I alluded earlier, um, he distinguishes between leaders and power wielders. But here's what Mao said about leader, about power. He said it grows out of the barrel of a gun. So to me, leadership is this simple. If I can get you, Sydney, to do what I want you to do, whether it's by holding a gun to your back, whether it's because I'm a professor at Harvard and I am claiming my authority and saying, please listen to me for an hour and a half because I've got all these credentials, or whether it's because I'm adorable and say, let's go to this movie tonight and not the movie you want to do, do. In other words, I use influence. To me, they're all leadership, all of them. But again, I am an exception because most people in the leadership industry do not feel that coercion belongs in the lexicon of leadership. I think coercion is a fact of life. I think if your boss tells you do yeah. this or do that, you're not literally being coerced. There's no gun at your back. But you can pretty well say to yourself, you know, if I don't do it, I'm likely maybe you know, something bad is going to happen. Maybe I'll even lose my job. I think it belongs in the leadership lexicon. But the answer to your question of what is leadership really depends on who you ask and what is the situation within which you're describing the, the act of leadership. So sorry to be, uh, <coughs> I'm not being evasive. Yeah, but as I said, the way I, I see some other questions, I don't want to continue uh, with you, and we, I'm happy to talk about a little bit more at, after six. All I'm saying is, 
by including coercion, I am deviating from my colleagues in the industry. For example, Dartmouth, which now has a leadership curriculum, I can assure you, most professional schools, coercion is not in the leadership lexicon. We don't teach students how to coerce. But in the real world, guess what? I pick up my newspaper, I turn on my television, I go on the internet, the world is full of coercion. Coercion matters, power matters. So why exclude it from this conversation? I have no idea. Except that the leadership field is one, it's, I could call it Pollyanna, and it would be, you, you get the point. Okay, uh, some other people had their, yes, go ahead. Are we supposed to uh, have people say their names, or we don't care? We don't care who they are. Oh, okay, uh, I don't care who you are. What Go ahead. MBA programs have you seen in this nation that are actually adapting itself to a more liberal arts-based business program? And the other question is, um, you mentioned in the beginning that military leaders are some of the most trust, tr uh, they're trusted. They're the top of the list. Yeah, they're the top yes. of the list of the most trusted um, yeah. leaders. Why, why do you believe that's the case? Okay, first of all, I should say they're going down. <laughs> the military, military leaders are not as trusted as they were five years ago. Uh, so they're, they're dropping along with everybody else, is dropping like a stone. Uh, you know, for, uh, they're, uh, I'll stay with that question. I think you asked me another question, but just to stay with the military one. Um, I think most, first of all, a couple of things. I yesterday asked in my class of almost 60 undergraduates, uh, how many of you have had any experience with the military lived, been in, whatever, and one person raised their hand and said, oh, I, I'm in the ROTC. So I think one answer to your question is, most of us know not the slightest thing about it. So we're at a remove, and we go, oh my God, at least those guys seem to know what they're doing, and by and large, they do. I don't mean to knock it. I'm just saying that when we ask a question, like what is your trust in military leaders, most Americans are answering from a position of total ignorance because the, the connection between the civilian and the military in the United States is, in my view, rotten, shamefully rotten. I wish it were closer. I think that's part of it. I think part of it is we feel they generally perform very well, and they do. Uh, West Point has a very serious leadership uh, training program, and they do leadership all the way through the four years but they've got a very particular population of a very particular age with a very particular mission, and their model is not easily replicable on other undergraduate college campuses. You had a first part to your... Oh, uh, what MBA programs uh, do you Oh, what, uh, what programs do I think? Well, the only one that even, uh, I, I, you know, there's those who really, uh, who talk the walk and those who walk the walk, so I, in my view, the answer is none. Uh, th there, there, is more, there is more lip service now to liberal, in part because of the complaints, of which I cited some. Everybody kind of gets your, a lot of people are going to business school, but our trust in business leaders is really low. It doesn't seem to teach a lot about some of the things we wish it would teach about, such as corporate social responsibility. Uh, but you know, the world is full of gaps between uh, what's fantasy and what's reality. The fantasy is the business school. The reality is that we are very disappointed. We had a big finance, and this, I'm just talking about Americans, a big financial collapse. We say, oh, these hideous corporate leaders, and they're still earning very, 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 very large sums of money, in particular in a time of high unemployment and so forth. Our capacity to do something about it um, seems to be quite limited. In other words, for all my emphasis on follower power, and I do talk about that a lot, uh, what we're better at as followers in the 21st century is pulling down. We're not, we haven't yet figured out how to use some of this newfound um, power and influence and translate it into something positive and constructive. I hope I'm being clear. Am I being clear? Yeah, okay. Uh, yes. Yes, hi. Yes. Yeah. I'm um, I'm Zhu Shen, and I have a question. Sometimes uh, people will become a leader before they learn what is leadership exactly. Yes. And what can we do if you're a leader? Sometimes they didn't know what is leadership and what the fellowship can do to push your leader to become yeah. a real re leader. Yeah. It's, uh, it is the best question, how can followers make leaders better? There are, by the way, one billion books on leadership, and there are three on followership. 
So you can actually buy the three books on followership fairly easily. Um, one of them is titled The Courageous Follower because it raises the question just the one that you're raising. So you have a leader who either is new, as you're suggesting, or I, I, let me talk about the workplace, okay? Let's, not, let's move from the community to the workplace. Or you have a boss who is less than wonderful. Um, so what do you do about it? The book that I wrote titled Followership, publisher was Harvard Business Press, and they say, you know what you've got to do at the end of the book? You've got to answer your question. You've got to tell people, you've got to give people a hint as to how to deal with bad bosses and bad leaders. You've got to help them. I groaned. I hate doing that kind of thing. But I did it because I was asked to do it. But my answer is much less sanguine, much less positive than, than my comment seems to imply. There's a reason there's so much bad leadership. By the way, I can ask any number of audiences, have you ever had a bad boss or a bad leader? 80% of the people say, I've had a rotten mayor in my town, I've had a rotten boss, uh, I've had a rotten church leader, I've, in a, my, the president of my sorority stinks. I hear it all the time. Then I say, oh, well, well what'd you do about it? Couldn't really do anything. So I am often asked, well, well, what should I do, what should we do? And I go, I don't really know. So the book, and I can easily give some easy things. Well, you've got to get together, you've got to organize, be careful that you don't want to be a whistleblower because that's going to risk being, you know, having bad things happen to you. Uh, learn how to speak to your boss, whatever it is. But there's a reason. Uh, I, I am of two minds about this. On the one hand, as you heard me say before, Again, if I were queen of the leadership universe, I would give every bit as much attention to the study of bad leadership as good leadership. Because I think unless we start to think about it, tackle it, study it, we're never going to figure out how to stop it. I often make a parallel to physical diseases. We throw money at AIDS, at cancer, at heart disease. Why don't we throw money at bad leadership? Bad leadership is endemic to the human condition. It costs hundreds of millions of lives. Why, are we, why have we never done anything about it? We don't know how to do it, and so doing it is often risky. In other words, I can lose my job, I can lose my friends, I can be marginalized, my, my fraternity, the rest of my fraternity is going to hate me if I take on the president. Uh, I'm going to invest a huge amount of time and energy, and nothing's really going to happen anyway. Uh, so there are real costs to taking on a bad leader or trying to upend a bad leader. So my very short and entirely, I appreciate it, unsatisfactory answer is to analyze the situation in which you find yourself and if you have a bad leader to try to come up with some constructive ideas. I'm not into professional suicide. I don't believe people should, you know, oh, I'm going to speak to the leader. You know, who wants to, I'm not into masochism. So the question is, how do you take on a bad leader without simultaneously doing yourself in? And it's not an easy question to answer, and I won't diminish the importance of your question by giving you an easy answer. I will simply say, there are tactics and strategies best discovered by analyzing the situation in which you find yourself and discovering who might be some of your allies in actually trying to take this on. Uh, uh, yeah, you and, I'm sorry, I have to say you and then you. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, can you explain the difference? I think you're supposed to wait for the mic. Could you explain the difference between power, authority, and influence? Easy. Uh, power, as I said earlier, is coercion. If I can force somebody to do something, again, as, as far as I'm concerned, an obvious leadership tool. Authority grows out of my credentials, my title, my position. As I said earlier, you're agreeing to listen to me because uh, Professor Samwick muttered something about me being at Harvard, and you're assuming, all right, she can't be a complete idiot. Uh, so <laughs> my title is enabling me to stay, my status or my credentials, and influence is exactly how it sounds. And they are the three fundamental leadership tools. They're mostly conflated, but they're very, very different kinds of resources. And if you're in a position of leadership and management, you're well advised to think through uh, what is the nature of the situation and when might you want to use power, when might you want to 
draw on your authority and when might you want to exercise influence. By the way, you're clever, again. What do you imagine the leadership literature spends 99.9% .9 of its uh, time and energy writing about, talking about the industry? What are they mainly into? Yeah, influence, influence. The leadership literature is, is a kind of Pollyanna-ish literature, flattened hierarchies, collective participation, worker participant, teams. Oh my God, if I say the word teams one more time, I'm going to vomit. <laughs> but that's the modern leadership literature. The politically correct leadership literature is about this kind of collective feel good whatever, and I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying that in the real world, it's not about feeling good all of the time. In the real world, it's not only about influence all the time. It's also about power and also about authority. By the way, one little PS apropos followership. Five years ago, even three years ago, when I was asked about authority, my example, I wonder if any of you could guess this. I should play a game with you and see if you can guess. There was one example I had that was the paragon of authority. Anybody want to take a flyer? Otherwise, I'll just tell you. It was the Pope. I went, oh my God, the Pope, the highest, highest, the authority, I, that was my exemplar, my example. It was the ideal type of somebody whose position or power as a whatever, as a leader, effectualness, effectiveness came out of the position he held. Well, guess what's happened in the last few years? Uh, it's a very interesting case study. I wrote about it in one of my books, but even since I wrote about that, uh, I wrote about the case of the Boston Archdiocese. Some of you may have followed Ber uh, Cardinal Bernard Law, who was finally pushed out because of activists. This is in followership. Uh, but even since then, uh, the world has changed for the Vatican and for the Pope, with countries all over the world taking on uh, the Pope in a way they never would have before. So I have nobody left now to point to as a sort of icon of authority. Uh, yes. No, I'm sorry, the woman in the back had her hand raised first, and then I'll get to you. Hi. I had a question. It's more of a curiosity thing that I've always wondered. Um, you, you talk about Max Weber and his idea of charisma and, and leadership, and a lot of times you know, people will say that leaders have this aura about them or yeah. some kind of charisma. Um, also in literature and in culture, you, you experience that aura or charisma yep. and I, I wonder if this aura or charisma is something innate or is it just them being nonconformist? Is leadership being, is leadership? I'm sorry, how does nonconformity enter, enter into it? Well, in the sense, they're not, they're not really adhering to what is. You mean the, the charismatic leader? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. In yeah. other words, they're not typical. In some way, yeah. they're atypical. Yeah, they are atypical. Okay, okay. Well, there's the Weber answer, and there's the more collective culture answer, but I'm going to give you the Weber answer. I think Weber would probably agree with you that this is somehow out of the norm. Uh, but the way to understand Weber's charismatic leadership is by, uh, I wish it weren't called, Lee, I wish there were another word, because it's every bit as much about the follower. It's really actually more about the follower. The aura, to use your very good word, is um, it's, it's about what that aura does to the followers. And they're at the, in the pure form, it is an adoration of and attachment to that absolutely transcends the norm, to go back to your point about unconventional. By the way, Barack Obama, I, normally the word, as I said, in my view is um, abused, but o Barack Obama in 2008, before he came, since he came, became president, I have no idea what happened to the charisma. But before, <coughs> did any of you volunteer for Obama? Any of you go to some rallies? Well, you may know at least as well as I. Some of those rallies, when you would see them on TV or if you were at some of them, they were huge. This was, by the way, he himself is a follower, a product of everything that I've been talking about when I mentioned followership. Nobody had heard the name Barack Obama a couple of years earlier. It was Hillary Clinton who was supposed to become the president. And everybody's going, Barack who? Obama? I mean, totally unheard of until you had this genuine grassroots campaign. Uh, and he would uh, sometimes appear, quite often, before audiences that were absolutely enthralled. 
That's probably the last example we've had in this country of truly charismatic leadership. And it's a great example of how when circumstances change, it can vanish just like that. So good question. Thank you. Uh, yes. You mentioned Bernard Law and that you wrote about yes, um, I did. the scandal. So would you classify Voice of the Faithful as an example of followership? The chapter is about Voice of the Faithful. Okay. The chapter is about Voice. Bernard, it's, a, it's in followership. So it's Voice of the Faithful that is the subject of the chapter. Precisely. Very good. You do very well in my class. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, this question, and then if there's one more, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes. Uh, thank you for your wonderful uh, speech and thank lecture. You. Uh, um, uh, you, I, I agree with you on the point that uh, uh, we sh it is very important to incorpor incorporate um, liberal arts into uh, MBA education. And uh, my question is, uh, if our society is structured economically and uh, politically uh, the, the way as it, it is now today, uh, how could our education make a change? Thanks. Well, one of the things you learn when you learn the liberal arts is revolution. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not advocating a revolution. Uh, but one of the things you do learn uh, is how to bring about change. You know, what is leadership? You know, another uh, synonym for leadership is an agent of change or a change agent. Uh, and one of the, you know, often the question comes up, what's the difference between a leader and a manager? Um, one of the standard answers is the manager kind of presides over the status quo, and the leader wants to create some kind of change. That's the point of being a leader. Um, so uh, you know, my, my general answer is uh, I incredibly believe that the study of history, the study of this kind of literature, gives I see it in papers that I get from my students, gives people a lot of ideas on how to create change. The extreme example, of course, is revolution, but it's not always about revolution. But it is trying to figure out how do you, whether it's on the Dartmouth campus, whether it's in your large company, whether it's in the body politic. Uh, and I do not feel, apropos your question, I do not feel that we are preparing leadership students to really create genuine change, precisely for the reason you say, because it's, all societies are very resistant to change very resistant. So if you really want to make something other than what it is, you have to really think through, oh my god, how has this happened before in human history? Human history is full of change. But you have to have some sense of how it's happened, especially if uh, you want to challenge some of the structures that you're talking about. They are resistant to change. Any last question? Otherwise, were any burning last whatever? You're all totally satisfied, yes? Okay, in that case, thank you very much.